Okay, welcome back. Uh, Mondays and Fridays are Zoominars uh, days, and uh, welcome back, everybody. We are very happy to have uh, John Cochran with us. Hi, John. Hi, everybody. So he will talk about reopening the economy and other economic aspects. Today, we teamed up again with SFS, the Society for Financial Study. And as usual, I would like to go back and do some housekeeping. So I want to say a few words about what's coming up and what we have done so far. Last Friday, we have seen Paul Krugman. He was talking about the big distinction between recessions, which are caused by an external force versus internally forced, where some imbalances are building up, where I think the latter will go back to the normal circumstances much faster than uh, recessions where there was some imbalances building up beforehand. So he was quite optimistic. As soon as we get the virus under control and the politics is right, we will go back very fast. On Friday, we will talk with Larry Summers. It will be slightly different in format and we will try out some new technology. So be patient with us. We will experiment with some new technological features and there's the risk of something going wrong on that side. And then next Monday is Memorial Day in the United States and we will respect the Memorial Day. So next Monday, we won't have a zoom in arm, but then it will go on subsequently next subsequent Friday and so forth. So of many interesting speakers coming up. Uh, here's a partial list of the speakers. So today we talk about opening and in Bavaria, where I'm from originally, the beer gardens can open up uh, today, but of course only for high-tech service beer gardens in a sense that you have to order everything with apps and reservations have to be made in advance and there's distancing and all the other requirements. And of course you have to stay far from each other. But the big question is, will actually, once the restrictions are lifted and the supply restrictions are lifted due to regulation, so the lockdown is, is over, will demand come back or will people be afraid to come and consume? The same will hold for restaurants. So the big question is, will it be the supply restriction due to regulation or will even without an official lockdown, demand will be collapsing and there's no coming back? One guidance we can have is from China. Of course, they are ahead on time. And what I've seen here on the Twitter feed by Michael Pettis, essentially what you see is that actually when you look at the subway ridership in the 30 major Chinese cities between 2020s, comparing 2020s and 2019, you can see that, you know, it's coming back. The ridership in general is coming back. Um, but it's not at the level back we have seen before. So you see some trend coming back here. But what's also interesting is, so you see the weekend effects and during weekends it's much lower and it's the same the case right now. But you also see a Friday spike. So what a lot of subway riders were using on Friday night, again going out and you don't see the Friday spike coming back. So the argument goes, most of the work related travels are coming back, but the travel, which is related to leisure and fun, is not coming back to the same extent. Now, what is, you know, what is our aim? And the aim can be characterized either you want to flatten the curve or you want to crush the curve. Okay, so if all the idea is you want to bring down the infection rate below the ICU units you have, so in intensive care units you have, that's what the flattening the curve is. And then there are all these SIR models, which ultimately go for some herd immunity. So the idea is that, you know, people get infected and then once they're infected, they're immune against that. But the problem with SIR models is they might not be sensible if the immunity is lost soon after you have been sick. So you can fall sick a second time. And we really don't know yet whether you can fall a second time. And the second problem is if you fall sick, and might become immune even then, but you have long lasting health damages, but then going for this herd immunity is also not a good idea. And hence crashing the curve, being much more radical, might be the better outcome. So you want to return to a world where you can actually trace individuals, individual cases, case by case, and avoid some, you know, relying purely on herd immunity. And that, you know, depending what opening, reopening choice you choose, might, uh, might be, a big decision which way you go. Do you go more for your immunity? Is it really important in your opening strategy or is it not important? 
So what's the problem with opening up too early? So the problem is a potential second wave. You have a picture of this, so it's the first wave. If you don't interact now, but you might have a second wave here, the blue one, uh, the blue curve here. So you bring uh, the, the sickness below the ICU units, the dashed uh, horizontal line, but then there will be a, potentially a second curve. And the problem is once you open up, firms can't just open up. They have to invest to open up. So especially small and medium enterprises. Think of the beer garden. It has to install some apps for the ordering, which it didn't do before, and go for high-tech solutions. And every firm, small firms, large firms, have to do significant investments. And if there's a subsequent flare-up, that might lead to a second wave and a second shutdown. But then it's actually more likely that the firm will go bankrupt because it invested again and used some of its remaining cash reserves for this open up, opening up investments. And that's one danger. The other danger is of the second opening up, then actually after a second shutdown, firms might be much more reluctant to open up. And that's, you know, I talked to Jean-Pierre Landau, my co-author and friend, uh, you know, he pushes very much this way of, of being aware that you have this huge fixed cost for many, many companies, and that might be the whole, makes the thing more problematic. Another aspect concerning the opening up is, should you open up synchronized or non-synchronized differentially? So if you think of supply chains and value chains, we talked about this with Benny Goldberg at length, and Danny Roderick was also talking about supply chain management then actually you would like to open up across the globe at the same time uh, because you know it doesn't help if one part of the supply chain opens up and the other part does not or if the global demand is not back or you want to do it much more focused at the regional level for example or in a certain industry sector level and you also can do some regional experimentation that's probably another way to go do you want to do it synchronized or not synchronized that's another decision variable to look out for and then the third thing is how much do you want to plan that? Uh, do you want to have it very centrally organized? The central government, central government is organizing that. It decides based on certain criteria how essential is a certain industry, how much health risk is, uh, is related to this particular industry. And then you look at an input output tables, how this industry fits in the whole economy wide input output tables, and you make some central planning around that. And the argument is it should be centralized and should be done by the government or even at a global scale, since private sectors might not internalize the externalities fully, especially the, risk, the health risk externalities. But there's always an argument to say, leave it more to the market, leave it more to the private agents, because private actors are much more creative to find ways how to open up and the best practices how to open up. And I'm very impressed in the United States and other countries, how different industries find ways to open up in clever ways, which are much less risky from a health perspective as well. So here's one idea. You could even go so far that you might open up a contest or competition for the best business practices, how to open up within an industry. And if you push forward, if you bring forward the best plan, how to open up, you might get some temporary monopoly power, similar to what we do with patents. If you come up with the best idea, a new invention, you get some patent for some years. Here you could say for some weeks, you might get a head start over others. If you come up with the best business practice, how to do that, uh, might be a little bit uh, a, a crazy idea, but it's similar ideas you can uh, push here for best practice as well. Now, finally, I would like to say what is special and what's very different uh, from many, many other crises here, or more pronounced, I would say, is this rise of uncertainty. We don't know with huge aggregate risk how long the pandemic will last and when we will you know, discover a vaccine, when will it come back? You don't know whether your employer will suffer some outbreak in his shop and you might suddenly not be able to go to work anymore. You might suddenly be unemployed. So the level of uncertainty is extremely high and the level of uncertainty you know, is a certain amount of exogenous risk in the system that's unavoidable. But of course, you can actually, the economic system might indulge, create some endogenous risk, make the system even more risky. And bad communication might amplify the uncertainty, the exogenous uncertainty, and create additional endogenous risk. So it's very important to have the right communications by the leaders of various nations to reduce at least endogenous risk in the system in order not to amplify the existing underlying uncertainty. 
So what are the economic consequences of this high level of risk? Can be idiosyncratic risk or systematic risk. Of course, higher risk leads to lower investment that slows down growth, and that creates some inflationary pressures. So in general, you know, I worked on this new paper with, you know, we're thinking which channels lead to more inflationary pressures, which one leads to more disinflationary pressures or deflationary pressures. So higher level of uncertainty leads to less investment, lower growth, uh, more inflationary pressure because of lower growth. On the other hand, higher uncertainty also leads more demand for safe assets. That actually brings the risk free rate down. That makes it easier for the government to issue a lot of debt. And that's actually a disinflationary pressure, so it brings inflation down. And the third thing is if part of the economy is shut down, it leads also to more inequality across sectors. And as we show in this paper, when inequality goes up, actually it's a disinflationary force. So all of these forces are various forces at place, and uncertainty plays a key or risk plays a key role in explaining that. So very much before we go to John, I want to do a poll again as usual, and I hope you can answer some of these questions. With this, I would like to ask you, should the economies be opened up rather soon or wait since it's still too risky to get your take on that? Then the second question is, should the opening of be governed by the free decisions by a flexible government? The government can decide and re-optimize really as it was, wants. Should it be the government? Or do we want to have some clear ex ante rules? What are the criteria based on which we decide uh, how to open up and not open up? And what should be the selection criteria? Which region should be allowed to open up or which industry should be allowed to look, open up? Depends it only on health risk or how essential a certain industry is or some other criteria developed by the government? You can choose more than one answer to that. So all of them are multiple choice questions. And then the, the final question is, the opening procedure, should it be centrally planned? Yes, because private firms don't internalize all the externalities, especially health externalities, or should it you know, not so centrally planned? Because it stifles innovation, how to open up and create and manage the new economy after you know, COVID, and we have to find new ways to do this, and the private sector is more innovative in this dimension. So let's uh, give you a little time to vote, the votes are still coming in. To speed up, otherwise, uh, it's still coming in fast. Okay. So, should we open up the economy? And it's surprising, rather soon or wait, it's actually 51% say rather soon and 49% you should wait. So it's really half, half. It's almost 51% to 49%. It's uh, very, very tight. The opening should be governed by free decisions by the government or rules. 67% say it should be really driven by rules and only one third, 33% think it should be, the government should have a lot of flexibility doing that. How should you select which sectors can open up? 54% uh, think you know the health risk is the key. The essentiality of the industry is 33%, and other criteria is only 13%. And then how should you open up? Should you plan it centrally? Should it be centrally planned? Uh, because firms don't internalize it. 63% think centrally planning is better, and only 37% think. No, no, it's better if innovation comes through the private sector to give the private sector more freedom. So with this, I would like to stop my part and pass on the floor to John, who will take over from now and share his slides. Thank, Looking thank forward you. to your talk, John. Um, quickly, before I share my slides, I'm, I'm delighted we ran that poll. I think my job in the next hour is to persuade the majority that was in favor of ex ante rules and central planning, that they're out of their bloody minds, uh, <laughs> and that we will neither cure the disease uh, and crater the economy if we try that, that mode. Uh, but we'll see how far we get. <laughs> <laughs> I did uh, make some slides. Uh, now if I can find them. Uh, here we go. Uh, mostly just to keep us on track and give you guys something to look at other than uh, 
um, the two of us while we uh, chat. <laughs> um, what I'm going to try to do here is uh, peer into the muck of where we're going, the near, near term, the reopening, the midterm, what happens summer and fall, and, uh, and then the longer term, um, what does recovery look like? Uh, how long does the recession last? And what does the aftermath look like to the extent we can? Uh, I, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed. I haven't done big academic papers on it, but I have a side job as a blogger and op-ed writer. So I've been reading a lot about this and I'll try to put together the ideas that, see, that seem to me that stood out, the things that you might not have thought of um, in, in these uh, questions. So let, let's start with the near term. Um, the question is not reopen or not. We're, we're heading to reopening. The economic carnage is, is more than can be uh, done. The question is, what's the reopening going to look like? And I think we're fated to what I call a dumb reopening. Uh, I, was, I, I, I loved, Marcus gave me a great example of something to make fun of. <laughs> Um, we're all great at sitting around the faculty lunchroom and coming up with really great ideas. I liked uh, Marcus's idea of a, a contest where people would be given temporary monopoly power. You look at the bureaucratic capacity of our governments, and this is just hopeless that they could implement anything like that. Uh, we've been talking for months about, first of all, a smart shutdown. Got to recognize how medieval this business shutdown is. We're supposed to have public health. That, that tests, traces, uh, figures out where things are and, and, and stops viruses that way. If not, the fact that the lunchroom easily said, well, we'll shut down businesses, but we'll do it carefully, like an auto body paint shop. Well, that can keep going because they're wearing masks and respirators anyway. But no, just everything shut down except essential things and that there's a lot of politics and who got called essential. It's, it's just medieval. It's a panic button response. And I, I emphasize this because I'm afraid where we're going is that that uh, is going to become the default. The government's policy action is to shut down all businesses that it decides are, are inessential, where it's actually back to, it, it's medieval about what we should be doing. So we're headed towards a dumb reopening, meaning we don't have all the, pro Marcus, you guys all wanted ex ante rules. Our governments don't have rules now. Here we are, we've been like two months into this. You could have written some rules about how often you got to wipe stuff and so forth. They have no idea of what rules to do now. And we're two months into it. Into it, we don't even have basic uh, protocols there. There, I, I talked to a business person actually, and and you know they they've got all these conflicting lists of what they should do, and they're afraid to be sued if they don't do it exactly right. Um, we and and never mind what we were supposed to be now is to have the bureaucratic capacity for the testing, the tracing, the public health, which takes over. That's just a dream. Uh, just this morning, I'm hearing news reports. Oh gee, we better build some contact tracers and, and get them up to snuff. No, we're going to open up and, and none of the detailed regulations or even guidance is going to be in place. Uh, Marcus also, uh, and, and, and don't, you know, we're just talking about vaccines and cures and testing and so forth. That, that's months away. Uh, ready or not, here we come. Um, Marcus, I think very nicely showed you uh, the, the, the simulation results that said, oh, here comes the second wave. And I, I think there's this big mistake of thinking that the government's policy letter, lever is shut down business or open up business, which only, by the way, only about half the businesses are essential. The other half are going, are, are going on anyway. Um, and, then, and then it comes back. So the models are saying you'll get a second wave, things will be worse. On the other hand, those models were drastically wrong last time around. So our first job is to think about in the dumb reopening, what's it going to look like? Are we, are, we, are we doomed to have the second wave that the models show? And so that's one thing I, I think I can show you that might be a little bit novel. And it, it brings to uh, those of you who aren't following it, that there's been an, an outpouring of, of economic uh, research on the question, on this question. So where did the, the let's remember the prediction that we're going to have a huge second wave and, and it's going to be uh, bad is the same prediction that we had in February. So uh, in February, let's remember what all the models were saying. So I'm trying to get my, uh, whoops. I, I can't see my own slides because the polls are in the way. Hey, Marcus, you know how to solve that problem? No, it doesn't matter. I don't need to say see my slides. Um, so uh, the models in la last February, what was the scientific model consensus? Uh, it was this SIR model, basically. Uh, which said you would have exponential growth 
uh, uh, as people give it to other people. That exponential growth would only be limited when the person who has it goes out and runs into so many other people that already are immune that they can't pass it on to someone else. So the crucial piece of the SIR model is very easy to understand. Someone who has it gives it to other people that grows exponentially. What's the force that stops it? Only when all the people you bump into have already had it and, and, and that's when the disease can't spread anymore. Now that model made uh, clear predictions. It said this would sweep through in a matter of months. 60 to 80% of the people uh, would get it. Uh, at the time, we thought there was a 2% death rate. So where there would be in the US something like three to six million people dead. Uh, and then it would swiftly go away. Uh, on that basis uh, is, is where all of our governments jumped in and, uh, and, and, um, and, uh, and shut things down. And that was exactly wrong. So this did not happen. What happened instead is that much earlier than expected, uh, cases plateaued. Hospitals are still uh, empty in many parts of the country. New York was right about at the limit, uh, but didn't uh, have a, a, even an Italy uh, outcome and, and not the much worse thing. So why did the models fail so badly last time? And the same models are telling us we're gonna have a, 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 a huge uh, problem again. Well, they left out two things. And this is the two things I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to leave you a couple things that might not be new, might, 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 might be new. Um, behavior and heterogeneity. Behavior, people are not rats. <laughs> they read the newspapers uh, and, and they respond uh, to, to what's gonna happen. So people uh, by themselves noticed that uh, we have a virus around. Uh, air travel, for example, cratered long before the governments shut things down. And as you compare, say, the US and Sweden, it's hard to see the effect of the shutdowns. Uh, so much private behavior is, is taking into account of the virus. We'll get to heterogeneity in a minute. So this is one thing I did, which is uh, sort of faintly looks like actual work, which is why I brought it along. I, I made a little model that it's not, it summarizes, I think, in sort of a textbook way, some very sophisticated models that you're seeing out there. What happens when uh, people um, uh, pay attention to what's going on and adapt? Um, uh, so, um, what the model, uh, what the model um, uh, said here is, uh, I just changed one. So let me show you the, the model. The, the, the basic model has the susceptible and infected. Look at the top two equations, and just says um, uh, as uh, each susceptible person. Uh, runs into infected people at rate beta, then they become infected. So that's just the rate of, of new infections. Uh, what if people uh, are careful and according to the amount of disease, I over N, the number of infected people out there, they take actions to uh, reduce their, uh, their potential exposure. Um, well, uh, that's, uh, so my, my graph, uh, the first graph, remember, the first set of graphs showed you of a million people. It's sweeping through the population uh, very quickly. Uh, make that little behavioral change. People, so the, only, the, the reproduction rate goes down when there's a lot of infected people. When, when you think about, are we going to go to the grocery store? Well, how many people are there out there who have this disease? Let's not go today. Um, and that's, I think, the crucial thing I want to uh, point out. Uh, in, in the debate about uh, private versus government. Um, being careful about a disease is something that requires an enormous amount of micro level individual behavior. The government can say shut down or not shut down, but it's all about how often do you wipe down the surfaces? Do you wear your masks? Do you actually stay six feet away from each other? Uh, which kinds of activities do you do? Which kinds don't you do? Uh, that sort of individual behavior is, is what it's about uh, in, in any case. Um, so you just make that slight difference in the model, and uh, here's my simulation on the left-hand side. Uh, what happens instead is that, is that uh, it quickly stabilizes. People see there's infections out there. The uh, dashed black line is the reproduction rate. It's, the numbers are up on the right. Quickly, people quickly take action that reduces the reproduction rate until the reproduction rate hits one. If you think about it, one is a very it's a very attractive state here. 
Uh, if it's reproducing fast, people take more action. If it's reproducing slowly, people take less action. Uh, and and uh, so you hit a plateau. So that produces this low plateau. And then I, I want it to be a little bit um, uh, uh, hopeful. Um, what we do know is that uh, people are going to get better at this over time. So a, a test coming in might be a, a thing that makes it, if it's cheaper to take actions that stop you from spreading the disease, then you'll take more of those actions. So I, I just made this alpha coefficient uh, increase over time. And then what you get is, is a, uh, a spike of infections that slowly tails off. And that's what we seem to be seeing, a spike of infections way below herd immunity. Uh, uh, but it slowly tails off. And, and the key of a behavioral SIR model, it's, it's a, it just totally changes your attitude about it. We're not, it stops not because you run into people who are immune because they've already had it. It stops because people take action to stop it, people or governments. It's a fundamentally different mechanism. And I think that's the mechanism we're at uh, going, going into the summer. So that's, is that hopeful? Is that good news or bad news? Uh, it's a little bit of both. Uh, the good news is it doesn't, I don't think, if that's the way the world works, we're not gonna get a huge second wave. We're just gonna piddle along with this thing. It has to be out there just enough that people are just scared enough to do, to take the social distancing measures to stop it from growing. But that means it's with us for a long, uh, long, long time. Uh, there's some, some uh, bad news here. <laughs> Uh, well, I don't know about bad news. Um, the fact is you can't tell how many people have this in your uh, local community. Uh, so uh, I, I ran another little simulation. What if you become careful or less careful depending on the death rate, the increase in deaths? Uh, now that's a number we've got. And the problem is deaths happen two weeks after infections. And, and so this is like the famous story of controlling the shower temperature when it takes a little time from the hot water to get up to the shower or not. Uh, if, you, if you wait for a spike of deaths and then you become careful and then the deaths go away and then you get less careful, you can see here how we have, we have stable but, but converging waves. Um, so this led me, so I think what's happening is that private behavior is responding and, and causing us uh, to plateau. If that's true, that bodes well, that, that gives us the, the B minus summer, not a second wave of disaster, not the virus goes away and we never see it again, but just trundling along and living with this like a chronic disease. The, important, the most important thing that uh, policy could do here is give us good current information. How bad is it where you are? Because if you're going on old information, then, then behavior is out of date, and that can lead, lead exponential growth to, to grow up again. So giving us good information would be the cheapest thing that I think even, even our governments could, could uh, be able to do. So John, some people argue that uh, the reason why people now take it so seriously was because of the shutdown. Otherwise, you couldn't get through all the other news people have. So one had to shut down to signal to the people to change their behavior. What would you say to that? And the second yeah. question which came in is, we had a big second wave in 1918. Uh, what was so different between now and what will happen in 1918? Is it more yeah. seasonal component in 1918 because it was more yeah. different influence here? That, that, that's, uh, so um, I, I think you're right. Uh, so if you sort of look, Yes, airline stuff did crater. People were slowly getting careful. I think the shutdown did uh, cause everyone to pay attention. Uh, now that's a very different view of government. You know, and okay, we, you've got our attention now. <laughs> the question is, how do we get uh, back going again? And uh, you know, my, my fear of, of your other model of detailed regulation, they don't know what regulations to write now. Uh, this is, we have to learn what's effective and what's uh, not effective here. So, so waiting for regular, and then regulations will put in, once they'll put into place yesterday's, how do you stop this thing? And then they give everybody grounds to sue that you didn't follow the regulations. So that's my fear. Yeah, 1918 came back in waves. Um, uh, I think, so we do have the internet. I think the fact that we have lots more information now will help people to more quickly take actions. And there wasn't a lot of action being taken even then. I mean, maybe put a, people put on masks for a while, but they weren't even beginning the kinds of social distancing uh, things we're doing. So I, I think there's hope to hear it. A lot of 19, what happened in 1918 was also, it was an influenza and summer stopped its spread 
more than human behavior stopped, it spread. Um, and so it came back, but I, I don't know. Uh, let, let me move on. Uh, this is actually my only other slide, but I think it captures most of, I think, what we need to talk about. The second, uh, so one is behavior. The second uh, left out of the models and uh, is heterogeneity. And I think that's an important uh, thing for us all to think about as we all prognosticate about uh, what's going to happen here. Um, not all the children are average. Um, this, uh, the virus is spread particularly in super spreading activities uh, and places. Um, um, there are uh, bars, parties, nursing homes, cruise ships, jails, choir practices, meat plants, and New York City are uh, places where it spreads very quickly. Um, the public policy goal, the goal for all of us is to get this reproduction rate below one. But all, uh, variable, all interesting variables have fat tails in economics, and the reproduction rate is, is a prime one of them. So, you know, suppose there's 10 academics whose reproduction rate is 0.5. Give it to me and Marcus, we might give it to half of another person. And then there's one uh, bar hopper whose reproduction rate is 20. Well, the aggregate reproduction rate is three. And that's, I think, sort of what our situation is. But all you gotta do is stop the one bar hopper and the aggregate reproduction rate is down to 0.5 and that's good enough. Shutting me and Marcus down, getting us from 0.5 to 0.2 is, is basically pointless. Uh, and there's a reason I think that we're learning from the, from the medicine that this thing spreads mostly, most efficiently through long contact when people are together indoors, close and talking loudly. Uh, parties are, are particularly bad. Um, now it also spreads in other ways, but um, if you can focus your mind, the job is to get the aggregate reproduction rate under one. I think that's really helpful that all your, Stopping the big, the big super spreaders gets you an enormous amount of the way at not much cost. Um, so that insight tells you a couple things. One, I think it gives us insight of how and why it stopped much more quickly than we thought it was going to stop. Because it's obvious, don't go to a crowded bar inside where people are yelling at each other. Uh, things like nursing homes are a real tragedy, but I think, uh, you know, that's why it happened so quickly. I think like a third of all the cases in New Jersey are, are, are nursing homes. But it's also something that once fixed can, can stay fixed. So it, it's hopeful for explaining why it, uh, why, why it, uh, why it plateaued, because both behaviorally and regulation, we can stop those things uh, fast. I think it gives us hope that it won't start up again, because duh, who's going to do super spreading activities? Although I'm a little discouraged, I read both in, uh, in Germany and in South Korea, people quickly went back to nightclubs. Nightclubs, are you out of your minds? Uh, so that, that lowered some of my faith in human rationality. Um, it's also hopeful, <clears throat> one of the reasons why the shutdown was so, so god awful uh, inefficient. There's very little correlation between the spreading activity and, and the GDP involved. Uh, I wrote a, a blog post titled "Ban Parties, <laughs> Not Businesses." Uh, you know, birthday parties are like a classic super spreading event. There's, you know, birthday parties are fun, but there's practically no GDP there. You ought to be able to do this. Uh, you ought to be able to to contain a lot at not too much cost if you do that. Um, let me. Uh, so heterogeneity behavior. I'm trying to give you a couple things that are new. Let me move on to testing. I see you've had Paul Romer on, and, and I'm, I've been a big fan of Paul. He certainly found a, uh, a, a central idea. This is what Romer does greatly, is one clear idea and knocks the hell out of it. And uh, it's certainly true if we, could have <clears throat> if we could have a free test that all of us took each morning and five minutes later had the results, and we could somehow convince the sick people not to go out, uh, this thing would be over in a week. Um, but I'm, I'm, less, uh, I'm less hopeful, I think it's right that that would help us. It's kind of insane that we're spending $5 trillion on other things and, and not, not enough on the testing. But as, as sort of in prognostication, is testing gonna come save us? I think the answer is, is no for a bunch of reasons. Um, the problem with testing is in, unless you have that free test given uh, every, every day, everybody can take it. 
what are you going to do with the test results? And as I look out, the U.S. has basically no bureaucratic capacity to test and do anything with public health purposes for that test. Right now, testing is it's, it's diagnostic. You have symptoms, you go in, your doctor refers you, you find out if you're sick, which you knew already. Uh, it's a private result by HIPAA used for treatment and your name location isn't particularly shared with anything. We have in mind in the faculty lunchroom that the results are of course public. And of course there's a competent public health bureaucracy that tells you uh, who's got it, where they are, uh, traces down your contacts. And, and we just don't have, have any of that. We don't have random testing. One of the most useful things to know would be how many people in my neighborhood have it. We don't, we don't have the going, and I don't see us having uh, that capacity. Uh, I don't think we're-, well, we're I think right, we I, build up this capacity. Yeah, yeah but you gotta start. We've been building up capacity, you know? Well, we are just now, just now news reports, oh, governments are hiring people to contact trace. Well, that's nice. Uh, I think building up, building up a competent public health bureaucracy would be an excellent thing. And I, I hope we get one afterwards. Um, but for example, the, the ch we don't even, we don't need magic testing. You have thermometers. Uh, you could have said in January to everybody, fill out an app, take your temperature, don't go out if, if you're sick. We didn't do that. The Chinese had um, these cameras that take pictures of people getting on planes and uh, and try to see who's got who's got temperatures. I just saw last week the TSA is now thinking about maybe they might want to install some of these things. Um, so we need it, but we don't have it, and and God knows we're not going to build it and roll it out on a local scale in the next three months. There's some deeper issues. Let, let me read you how South Korea, this is just a quote about how South Korea did it. South Korea gave laboratories the green light to use unapproved diagnostic kits during a public health emergency. It gave health authorities warrantless access to CCTV footage and geolocation data from new patients' cell phones. They send prompt alerts such as emergency texts to disclose the recent whereabouts of people who have tested positive. Expansive tracing, mandatory forced isolation, uh, that's how they do it. Is America in, even gonna begin to do stuff like that? Uh, um, force you to disclose where you've been with your cell phone, force people who've tested positive to stay home. Uh, are we gonna trace where people go? So, you know, there's lots of towns that don't have it. Some uh, traveling salesman comes in, are we gonna track his location, say you gotta take a test? Uh, that's, what, that's how it works. Um, and we can debate uh, the whole civil liberties question about whether we should have it, but I don't see the U.S. building that capacity, at least uh, over the summer. Um, so, uh, yes, it's okay. possible, but it's not coming as fast as you think. So, yes, go ahead on testing, and then we'll move on to the summer, fall, and the economics. I just wanted to come back to the two main messages you had. One was essentially behavioral response. There's some uh, Nassim Taleb asks, you know, it could be a behavioral response which creates fat tails. So we see fat tails distribution. So do you think it's the underlying distribution is fat tail? Do you think it's a behavioral response to public reaction which creates the fat tails? That's what uh, Nassim Taleb would like to know. And Archel Fernandez thinks in terms of heterogeneity, your second main message, you also have heterogeneity between poor people and, and wealthy people. Poor people get more sick. How do you deal with this, that actually the inequality becomes much more pronounced now also in the health dimension? Uh, does this call for other measures and how does this fit into your argument? So I, I got to pass a rule. We're going to do one question at a time and I'll try to keep the answer yeah. short. <laughs> um, uh, so, I mean, the, the big inequality is people who have to go out and work, like bus drivers, has been really sad that they, they have really gotten uh, exposed to this. Uh, and uh, so, uh, um, I, I hope somebody will write the paper. We're seeing correlations that uh, poor people in minority communities are harder hit. How much of this is because they got to work for a living and they can't stay home and Zoom? Uh, how much is the uh, other kinds of, we know that this is really hits people with comorbidities. If you're older, if you have, if you're overweight, if you have diabetes, if you smoke, this is a lot worse. Uh, so what are, are the, the uh, um, portions of it? It's also, uh, the inequality thing is really, uh, I wouldn't, focus on the disease so much as the economics. Uh, this is uh, fine for uh, us one percenters sitting home and Zooming with a steady paycheck, but it's a real disaster on the, uh, you know, people who actually 
um, go out and, and do stuff with their hands uh, uh, and, and live a little more precarious lives. What, what haven't I answered? I forgot the questions now. <laughs> so that, that you answered the question about the inequality. The other one was the two alternative hypotheses why we observe a fat tailed distribution. One is that the underlying distribution is fat tailed, or it is your public response, the behavioral response, which leads ultimately to a fat tailed distribution. So which I'm, of the two hypotheses would you support? I may not be. So as I've read the stories of, we're now getting, we don't know how this thing spreads, which is really a, a crime of, of research. You know, where are, what is the danger and what's really not dangerous? Is it important to wipe down the handles, you know, in the bathrooms every half hour or not? But what, what I am seeing is that it spreads in places where people are together for a long period of time and, and breathe on each other inside. So that's, that's what I meant by the fat tail, the fat tail of, of reproductive activities. And that's the, that's the thing that has been cut back quickly. We just stopped going to restaurants, zero. Uh, and so that whole nexus for spreading the disease just got lopped off. Um, so that's what I was talking about, fat tails. And I, I, I don't see a behavioral response creating a fat tail of reproductive activities. We've We've knocked all those off and, and we're wasting a lot of time on not letting people go out to public parks together, which is an example of cutting a reproduction rate from 0.2 to 0.15 and completely a waste of time. Um, so let, let's, shall we move so, on? Essentially, you would argue you could, could cut down the fat tail even further by having more smart behavioral responses. Uh, so we got to do two things. We've, we've got to, um, our objective, this is, and I'm glad you, you brought me back to this. Our objective privately and publicly is get the reproduction rate under one at the minimal cost of GDP. <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, the, so we're, what you wanna get rid of is things that are high reproduction rate activities that have low GDP cost, birthday parties, sorry. You know, that, that's a classic example. Um, and you don't want to have activities that have very little actual reproduction rate benefit, but then cost you a lot of GDP. Um, so that's, uh, that's the objective. And, uh, you know, working down the fat tails seems to be, to me, to be the, a good way to prioritize how we're going to achieve that objective. Should we, let's move on to economics. Uh, we're supposed to be economists here, and you can see my, uh, my, bullet, my bullet list here was to <laughs> kind of give us an idea where we're going. Where, what happens in the summer, fall, and, and, and what happens afterwards. Um, so um, what can we say different? Uh, there's one scenario, I don't know what's going to happen, but one scenario is that we bumble along with this virus for a while, uh, that we don't have a vaccine testing and tracing that saves us over the summer, uh, and it doesn't come back in a huge V-shape uh, disaster in the fall. So let's work on that scenario for a minute. What happens economically is uh, we don't get, um, is we don't get the V-shaped recovery. Um, we don't get the, uh, the great vacation. Uh, there's two reasons this isn't gonna be the great vacation. That's one of them. The other is the financial uh, impact of this, which we're, we're gonna get to in a minute. Um, now, that we, we talk a lot about demand and, and Marcus went to demand, but I, I think I wanna point out something I haven't seen a lot of. This is a productivity shock. This is a really bad productivity shock, bumbling along with a virus. Uh, you know, they say, oh, we can reopen the restaurants, but only half the seats can open. That means the restaurant has to either charge twice as much for food, pay half as much in, in, in rent and wages. I mean, where's that money? You know, that's a, a productivity shock of a half for as long as it goes on. Uh, airlines with half the seat that, that, you know, leave the middle seats out. Well, why do you think airline tickets were so cheap? It's because they filled the darn middle seats. That's got to be twice the price or half the wage and, and therefore a, a lot less uh, uh, demand. Um, now, there's some hope in this as we get better. You know, how often do you really have to clean up? How, how far away can you stay from each other? What really are the dangerous activities or not? And if the regulatory response is flexible enough, you can cut down on some of that. But there's a big inefficiency there as, as long as you're doing it. A second thing that's going on is it's a reallocation shock. Uh, Steve Davis uh, just did a thing. He found that for every 10 jobs lost, three new jobs are created. 
Uh, it might be more than that. You know, all of these people who are going to clean up between customers have to get hired from somewhere. All these people are going to measure your temperature out in front of Costco, have to get hired from somewhere. Uh, Amazon is hiring. Um, so there is a reallocation and it's, it's actually, it's all low skilled work. So we ought to be encouraged about uh, low skilled employment. Uh, in, in the, but the reallocation has to happen. Uh, and that's, uh, that's a difficulty uh, as well. Um, uh, it would help a lot to have information about how it spreads and not. That would help us to do this more, uh, more efficiently. So let's start worrying about policy. Um, uh, the first thing I want to point out is that uh, policy now has to make the sharp change from insurance to disincentives. <laughs> uh, the, na you know, the natural thing was uh, this is a big shock. The government's going to come to the rescue. But if you want to get the economy going again, if you want the reallocations to happen, uh, at some point you have to start paying attention to the incentives. So uh, unemployment insurance now pays many people more than their old jobs paid. And we're getting anecdotal response. You know, restaurant owners are saying, I'm ready to reopen, come back. And the, and the waiters say, you gotta be kidding. I get more on unemployment here than I'm from you. Uh, those, those jobs, those many jobs that are out there, the reallocation jobs, the cleaning up jobs, mm -hmm. Uh, they're not great jobs. If you can, if, if the government's trying to preserve your old job, which is gone because the company's bankrupt, uh, that's going to get in the way of the reallocation. Um, when do we make people start paying their mortgage payments and their rent again? Uh, there's, you know, a natural, it's all on hiatus, but it's going to be very hard for our government to say you got to get going, uh, which unfortunately the economy only gets going from, from uh, incentives again. Um, Let's move on to macro and, and financial policy. Um, I think lots of us hoped that this would be the great vacation when it started, <laughs> uh, that the economy, you know, we shut down basically, as far as I can tell, we shut down from Halloween to New Year, and then January to everything starts up again. Uh, why is this not, why is the shutdown not the great vacation? Uh, we know for once what the shock was. And I think the central answer here is debt. Um, um, everybody is, uh, the, the U S economy is, is once again, showing up, up to its ears in debt. The, the average person doesn't just have to get through this by buying food and Netflix. The average person has to pay for rent and mortgages and consumer credit. Uh, you know, the airlines shut down, but they still have to pay for their, their, their debts. They all, uh, loaded up on debt on the way. Uh, this is about uh, paying for debts, and that's the uh, big the big macroeconomic danger uh, going forward. Um, a wave, you know, bankruptcy isn't the end of the world for an airline, but for most small business, bankruptcy is liquidation. So when the business goes bankrupt, it's not there uh, to start uh, up again. And uh, what's what's what we're heading towards? Now, here's the big question: If if it comes back, we, we might just escape this in the fall. But if this stays a deep recession through the fall, if there's a second wave, uh, then this all comes to bite. Um, and as uh, it's not just new debts, uh, it's old, as we're seeing with like the cities and states uh, and many airlines, you know, the first to go are the ones that have a bunch of old debts. So the, the plan is the Fed is going gonna, is gonna to help you pay your debts through for as long as this lasts. Well, this could be a lot longer than you think. Uh, and that's going to lead to the, the amounts of money are not just what do you need to get through the weekend. The amounts of money involved are what do you need to pay off five years worth of debts and, and keep up companies that were on the edge. So the, the point where, the, where it turns into a financial crisis, I'm sure Marcus will have comments on this too. One of the dangers uh, in the fall is the point where a, a uh, pandemic turns into a financial crisis. And that's been the central piece of, of finance of, of going along. Now, policy, the Fed has, has come to the rescue. Uh, both the Fed, Fed and the, we're talking about numbers like uh, $5 trillion to keep, ever, to pay everybody's bills, to pay everybody's debts for, as we go along. Uh, I'm, hey, John, I, yes, please. Questions. I just want to interrupt uh, briefly. Do you think that there, there will be huge stress on pension funds and banks and all that? So RDT would like to know. And then there are questions. Is it clear that, you know, reopening will prevent us if it's too early reopening and then we have to shut down again? It might be even worse. 
Yeah. Uh, so, so um, which way does it give you some clear guidance on the reopening the, the question or not? Well, uh, again, I wish and you wish the reopening was a smart reopening, carefully tailored to minimize the cost to GDP, flexible as we learn about the disease. I wish and you wish the reopening were coming with a public competent public health bureaucracy that could tamp out the embers and keep it going. Uh, I think there's three scenarios to go with. One scenario is it kind of melts away, whew, done. Uh, I think that's what the Fed's kind of counting on. The other, uh, the next scenario is it trundles along like a chronic illness and, and we're, um, and in the fall and the winter, we're still at nobody wants to go flying because they're scared of getting it. Restaurants are only serving half the number of people and, and you know, it, it's a very inefficient, along with demand declines because people are scared. And the third scenario is second wave, second shutdown. I don't know if they can do a second shutdown. The, the populist anger might be so mad because remember, we're shutting down. Most people who are hurt by this are old and retired. Uh, so there certainly is going to be a move for, look, let's isolate the people who are vulnerable to it and, and, and let the young people go. But there's certainly a, a bad scenario for the fall, which is a bad virus scenario leading to more economic contraction. Together with uh, everybody had about three months worth of cash going and they just ran out of cash. And then you get the wave of industrial bankruptcies. I don't think it's going to hit the banks immediately because the Fed can print money to keep the banks afloat. And the banks are not really that, that exposed, uh, but certainly a wave of industrial company bankruptcies would be a horrible thing for the economy. And that's kind of where I was going. Let's try and think through the support we've got is the Fed is going to lend money largely to companies that, uh, so the support has been, the big idea has been, well, we'll lend you money to pay your bills through things. But let's remember normal lending, there is a productive investment. And here we're just lending to pay bills so that you re can, can reopen again. Uh, and, and that runs out uh, at, at, some, at some point, you know, you're running a business. At what point do you want to keep borrowing months and months and months worth of expenses, all of which are going to be paid out of some future profits when you get to reopen, but you're not investing in anything. These are just future profits. Uh, so I think that if the economy doesn't pick up, all that lending is going to turn into gifts and companies may just decide to go under, uh, under anyway. I think all that lend, a lot of what we call lending now is going to turn into gifts anyway. Imagine it's next spring. We're desperate to stimulate the economy and every company is reporting, well, all of our cash flow is going to repay loans to the Federal Reserve. <laughs> I can't see the Federal Reserve demanding those loans to get repaid when, when we're trying to stimulate the economy here. Uh, so um, the, the big question is, does the economy come back fast enough that, the, that we don't turn this into a financial crisis, this time not in the big banks, this time in companies around? Um, when does the Fed run out of steam? So the Fed's basic approach here has been no creditor may lose money. Uh, we're gonna, we're, you know, we're, we're gonna make sure that existing people invested in, in bonds get to cash out at high prices. No price may go down, no credit or lose money. We're not gonna allow even large companies to restructure in bankruptcy. It, that, this is all a fine plan for a V-shaped recovery and it's over by summer and we can pay back three months of debts. But if this goes on for months and years, that, that plan seems to uh, be harder. Uh, so you, you want to stop in the fall and then we'll talk about the legacy of where we go after, after it's all over. But let me just say that the Fed has implemented uh, an SPV structure where the first losses are taken by the US Treasury. You think the, the single tranche or the equity tranche is not large enough if we don't have a V recovery? Right. <laughs> to start with, right. Second, you know, there, there's all this stuff between let us, let us, there's this fighting between Fed and the Treasury and the Fed needing to put a fig leaf over it that we don't, you know, print money and hand it to voters. But put a, put a circle around the consolidated government budget constraint. What they are doing now is printing money and handing it out. Uh, even the Treasury borrowing, the Fed is buying more Treasury bonds than the Treasury is issuing. So from a consolidated perspective, the government is printing money and handing it out with a fig leaf of lending. And some of it might get back and some of it might not get paid back. And there'll be some fights between Treasury and Fed about when those tranches run out and if they don't run out. 
Uh, maybe like last time, uh, we'll, we'll recover and the, the, you know, they'll make a lot of money on it. We'll, we'll see. But I, that's kind of like inside baseball, I, I think, as far as, as looking at the overall policy. But weren't, weren't you always arguing that you know, buying long-term treasuries and issuing short-term reserves is pretty much the same? It's like one smart for another smarty. So that's yeah, so, um, the difference then? Or? Reserves are short-term treasury debt. Uh, yes. that is conveniently under the debt limit. So we don't have to call Congress and say we want $5 trillion more treasury debt, which is what we're actually doing. Um, I am a little puzzled that the Fed saw the need to buy up a trillion dollars worth of treasuries uh, and the supposed turbulence in the treasury market. The Bank of England is now directly financing government debts. Uh, is that a sign that we're at the moment that the supposed insatiable demand for treasury bills is, is running into trouble? Um, the major criticism I would make of it now is I do think last uh, bullet point, which we'll get to, uh, you know, there is some issue about whether we're going to be able to repay all these debts. What happens to us if interest rates go up? Uh, what the Fed has done, uh, the Fed and Treasury together are doing is they're borrowing overnight to finance this $5 trillion. If they would only issue perpetuities at 1%, then we would be insulated forever from a debt crisis. And by doing it, uh, by shortening up the maturity structure, they make us, uh, you know, over the years after this, much more susceptible to that problem. But, but, but yeah, the treasury serves our perpetuities just with a floating interest rate on it. It's like a console. Right. With a, yes. right. I meant fixed rate. Lock in that. If you have any worries about debt sustainability, Locking in, unless you're a modern monetary theorist, locking in that 1% uh, uh, interest rate on government debt seems to me like just a, a wonderful opportunity that is once again getting foregone. So you think the price is not right in this dimension and the long term? No, bond well, I don't know about right, right or not. Uh, just from a microeconomic perspective, uh, the markets are selling us uh, insurance against interest rate rises at what seems to me like a advantageous price for the US government. Um, uh, it's, it's a risk management question. Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's $200 billion a year versus premium, uh, a premium for the right to never have to worry about interest rates going up again. But back to your point, uh, you are exactly right. Uh, maybe this we should highlight as points to learn. Uh, reserve, interest paying reserves and treasury debt are fundamentally exactly the same security. And it's just an interesting note that uh, the Fed seems to think the treasury can't stand on its own in borrowing right now. Um, can, can I just interject as you go through inflation? I think it will come up. What do you think about the tips break even inflation expectations for the next 10 years? Perhaps you can elaborate when you go through the inflation arguments. Okay, well, let's, 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 get, let's get to the legacy. Uh, I'm, I'm on the, um, uh, so we've gotten through the fall and the winter. My forecast, uh, let me just add my forecast here that I think we're going to end up with much more call it reserves, call it debt, whatever, than, than we're currently forecasting. Um, if, if this is a longer and deeper recession, if, it, if it's not kind of all over by October one way or another, uh, I think a lot of these loans are gonna turn into gifts. I think it's gonna be hard for the government to stop spending money. Uh, and I, so I think we're gonna end up with, you know, more like 10 trillion of extra government debt uh, or money uh, out, outstanding. So let's talk about where does that leave us in, in the long run? The, well, I'll, get, I'll, I'll wind up back to the debt question. Before we get to this, I do want to point out the moral hazard. So in 2008, uh, uh, grumpy people who didn't have to worry about uh, the impact of their opinions like me were saying, oh, the moral hazard of it all, what are you doing? The answer was the world is ending. We can't worry about moral hazard at a time like this. Don't worry, the Dodd-Frank Act will cure all the moral hazard. Um, <coughs> We are now doing 2008 on steroids. And something done over and over again uh, is now not an expedient, it is a rule. Um, the Fed has stepped, anytime a market looks slightly illiquid or a price seems like it goes down, the Fed jumps in and keeps the price up. Uh, the Fed is, we are bailing out airlines. We bailed, there's a populist anger over bailing out the big banks. Sorry, we're bailing out creditors of airlines. Airline bondholders apparently are not in a position to lose any money. Um, are they gonna get the full Dodd-Frank? Are they gonna be allowed to, to borrow money again? Whatever, we, we, are, we have now anchored some expectations and those expectations are private gain in good time 
and taxpayers, Federal Reserve picks up the losses in bad time. There will be no systemic risks. Um, all you got to do is, uh, is, is make it look like your market's a little bit illiquid. Um, for right or for wrong, uh, you know, boy, I'm, I'm glad I'm not in the Fed trying to decide between saving the world and moral hazard. But we certainly now have, it's not a one-off moral hazard. We have a regime. And that regime is in place. And that's that the Fed will pick up the pieces in any sort of downturn. Um, we uh, have, uh, and, and we're going to end up with a lot of uh, government debt and or reserves uh, outstanding. Um, let me point out, uh, so there's an active debate and, and, uh, on just does government debt matter? Uh, is this a problem? Should we worry about it? Um, I, I put down Summers, Blanchard, and Kelton as uh, three people who've advocated loudly don't worry so much about debt to various versions. Um, <clears throat> certainly, the, uh, the um, MMT attitude has taken over Washington uh, with some only faint voices complaining about it. Um, one thing I'll point out, as I read, uh, certainly Larry and Olivier and even Stephanie Kelton, I just read her book, uh, when they sort of say, don't worry about government debt, they always envision that therefore we can spend money on good projects. We can make good crafty infrastructure investments and not worry about the debt. What we're seeing in Washington is when you get the feeling that money doesn't matter, then spending it wisely doesn't matter. The first impact of the view, uh, we never have to worry about government debt is you can just throw money down rat holes. And uh, I, thought, I think it was very important rhetorically in Washington, if, if I say, let's spend money on, on rep subsidizing representational art. Marcus says, no, John, uh, eventually, you know, taxpayers will have to pay for that. Uh, well, absent that, that force, uh, we can just throw money down, down rat holes. I put on my slide stimulus checks as a great example. Uh, I'm, I'm all for helping people in trouble in, in a, a big unanticipated shock for ex post putting in the insurance that should have been there ex ante. But 60 million uh, Social Security recipients who are retired, uh, people on government pensions and government employees with jobs, do they need stimulus checks? It's just, it's an example of an extraordinarily inefficient uh, response to something. So we're, we wind up with 150% debt to GDP ratio. And where does this lead? Um, uh, Summers has been arguing about, you know, for more debt for a long time, the secular stagnation. Uh, Stimulate. Olivier Blanchard gave his uh, AEA address. Uh, R is greater than G. So, and not just R is greater than G now, but you can expand this and R will stay less than G. Uh, very sophisticated views. Uh, Stephanie Kelton, the MMT crowd says, don't worry about it. Uh, we can print money and never have to worry about it. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm, I'm still Mr. Fiscal Theory of the Price Level. Uh, I would say let's put these new theories versus a thousand years of history to the test. 100% debt to GDP, 150% debt to GDP ratios don't often work out well. It did once, twice, that I know of in history. Uh, we have successfully exited 150% debt to GDP ratio twice. The US after World War II was one of them. The United Kingdom after the Napoleonic Wars was another one. The United Kingdom after World War II was not a successful ex exit. They had uh, uh, endless um, uh, inflations, devaluations, financial crises, and so forth. How did we do it? Uh, my graph here is of the um, primary surplus, just to document that from 1947 to 1975, we ran steady primary surpluses. We had strong supply side growth, productivity growth, uh, and uh, the, in, in an economy that looked quite different from ours. Uh, that is a way to, we, we could do that. We could go back to regular primary surpluses, hard-headed fiscal policy, uh, and strong supply, su supply side, a lot of G. Uh, we could get lucky with the R and get out of it. But those are the only two times in history it's worked. <laughs> so I, I still think um, uh, the, the enormous amount of debt that's left over after this is something that we should worry about. Okay, uh, I'm done yakking. Uh, more questions? Yeah, so um, let me just say, are you surprised? So on the inflation Fed policy side, 
uh, are you surprised that you know, most of the corporate bond buying programs of the Fed are not really employed yet, but the, the corporate bond market stabilized already significantly in anticipation that if something goes further wrong, the Fed will step in. But so far, we haven't seen the Fed stepping in big time already. Yeah, these are, are about that? Oh, and I, I realized that I didn't uh, answer your, you know, what about the tips? What about the low treasury yields? Yes. Um, inflation is like the Spanish Inquisition. You never know when it's coming. <laughs> the inflation of the 70s was never forecast by bond markets. Uh, and uh, the mechanism is very much a mechanism of a run. If you, the minute you know a run's coming, it's too late because the inflation is there to devalue outstanding short-term debt. Uh, and, and, you know, everybody thinks, well, it's, it's not going to happen now, so I can, I can afford and I can get out, get out in time. So don't ever count on inflation being forecast. It is going to be a run. It happens. And it, it happens uh, just when nobody's expecting it. Corporate bonds. So uh, what the Fed has done, I, I, I talked to a corporate bond trader a while ago who said, oh, yeah, high-grade corporate bonds, nobody's putting any effort into uh, fundamental and value analysis because we know the Fed's going to prop it up. Uh, it's very interesting. So the Fed was unhappy with liquidity. It was unhappy with prices. And, I th and then it started buying as, in small amounts. And I think the signal it sent is we are not going to let these prices go below a certain amount. Therefore, you private traders can take risk. So in, in, it allows the, um, the, highly the still highly leveraged uh, banks uh, with still not enough uh, balance sheet capacity to do their jobs, once again, uh, it lets them jump in because they know they're not going to take losses on this stuff. And it lets it seem like they're the ones doing the buying and the selling. Uh, I, I must say, I mean, in terms of the lessons of, Mar Marcus, you've been writing about this. We've both been writing about this for 12 years. 2008, oh, money market funds. We have to bail out the market funds. 2009, we'll never bail out money market funds again. Bing, we just mailed out the money market funds. Uh, oh, how many papers have we written about the lack of balance sheet capacity among traders, among, among the big banks to form their liquidity, to do their liquidity services? Uh, all the, and, and then nobody ever got around to doing any of it. Here we are, boom. Uh, apparently, they're saying we don't have the balance sheet capacity to do our job. The Fed has to jump in and do it all over again. So you got an answer and a rant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So it's definitely interesting to view inflation as a run. Uh, I have to see how to model that because you know it, there's not the traditional run element like a bank run element where you can always get out at 100% until it's too late. There's no sequential sequential servicing constraint or something like this. Well, this the short term debt, short term debt. So uh, think of uh, let's do the real version. Think of Greece. Uh, <laughs> think of an economy that has that, that borrows in another currency. It's rolling over short term debt. The interest rate is low until people say, oh boy, that's going to be a problem. Then they charge a higher interest rate. That interest rate isn't sustainable. The whole thing blows up. Uh, if you print your own currency, the same thing happens except with inflation. You're rolling over short-term debt. The interest rate is low. Everybody thinks, well, I'm happy to hold this so long as the inflation isn't coming. The minute they think, ah, maybe these guys aren't good for it. And maybe the next rollover is going to be a problem. I think I'll get out now. Then the interest rate spikes, the debt becomes unsustainable, and then and then people are dumping the debt, which leads to inflation. So yeah, that's a, it's a fiscal theory view. It's not a Phillips curve. That's more like, fair enough. Um, so there's some questions I would like to come back to the initial behavioral response aspects. Um, so Vikram, uh, he would like to know how can you make sure that people perceive the risk correctly. There's a lot of behavioral research uh, that people misperceive risks. Um, they might be overreacting or underreacting very dramatically, in particular for this, you know, health risk aspects, because you don't, we don't, nobody knows, you know, how risky it is. Um, this is a great question. Would this distort behavioral response dramatically? And is this an argument for some official body to come in and regulate because people cannot perceive the risk correctly? So who's this you <laughs> who's going to be sure that people <laughs> behave correctly? Uh, we're, we're, there's... A committee of scientists. Or oh, yes. That's the usual prejudice. You and me, Marcus, we're going to get in charge and run everything. Uh, no, people's behavior is going to be, uh, now they have got every interest, uh, at least until they get sick. In fact, I think there's some worry about the opposite, that uh, people are too scared. 
uh, that people, for example, going, I, I've had a long discussion with my daughter, will she come visit us? Uh, she lives in Princeton. Uh, you know, can you take an airplane? And I'm going, of course, but uh, you know, we're worried about taking the airplane. Um, so people may in fact uh, overweight small probabilities as well as under. There's also the potential problem of externalities. People have a good interest in not getting sick themselves, but once they do get sick, they don't have any particular interest in not spreading it to other people. That's why you have need coercive isolation. The problem is the sledgehammer on the other side. A, a committee of all knowledgeable central planners could, I'm sure, do a much better job. But what we've got is the uh, is, is our government, and I think I would hope this experience teaches people the extraordinary lack of bureaucratic capacity, the extraordinary incompetence of the low levels uh, of our government at, at doing things. I mean, all they can do is shut all businesses down or not. And they can't even do that. They can say, pass an edict saying all businesses should shut down and hope that people actually do it. So, you know, you want a nuanced, uh, you know, get people to, to put on face masks when they go to Whole Foods, but not when they're running because we've gauged exactly the externality and the proper perception of the probabilities. I'm sorry, our bureaucracies just don't even begin to have the capacity to do that. But perhaps it's because not enough resources were spent on this government bureaucracy. I'm just telling because you where we are. <laughs> yeah, part of it is, so I, I do want to say I was, uh, a lot of my comments were, what I think is likely to happen in the next three to six months, and that the US builds a technocratically competent data intensive bureaucracy that could handle um, externalities uh, beautifully and pass regulations on exactly how each kind of business could run. That's not going to happen in, in the next six months, even if it could ever happen. Where, where our choice seems to be booting this sledgehammer of pass an edict to shut down all businesses. Versus, let's try to find a common ground, give people better information. So here's a policy I think our governments could do. Let's do some random testing. It's ridiculous that test, we're not using the test capacity we have. Why? Because the way you get a test is you think, I'm sick, I'll go to the doctor, I'll get a test, and that test doesn't get reported anymore. You know, <clears throat> the group testing idea that's been in, uh, in the papers, uh, uh, Christian Gollier has been pushing this. Uh, 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 just, just let's find out how many people have this now in Palo Alto, put that up on a website, give us better information about where we are. That would help people make decisions better. Maybe that's a good compromise between me and, and our questioner. Uh, to the extent that people are making behavioral questions, uh, make them better. Now, our experts have not been that great either. You look at expert res recommendations. First, oh, masks don't do any good. Oh, we all gotta have masks. Uh, <laughs> So it's not clear really the experts know a whole lot better than, than we So can I also interject one final question? So when Darona Simoglo presented, he primarily pushed, you know, we should really differentiate, as you say, between different risk spreaders, in particular also differentiate between old uh, elderly people and young people that should be treated differently in order to, you know, reduce the economic cost and also minimize uh, the cost on the elderly themselves. Um, but then one issue came up in countries where there are more intensive care units, people would behave less careful compared to countries where there are fewer intensive care units. So it's essentially like a very much a Chicago view in a sense that if you have very few intensive care units, it commits you to behave more responsibly. Uh, would you subscribe to this view or do you think people behave this way and take all of these aspects into account in their own behavior? So in the US where there are very limited ICU they would behave much more carefully than it compared to Germany, where there's an excess capacity of uh, intensive care units. Uh, I would, so uh, I have to pass on for your listeners who haven't heard it, the Chicago, this is not, isn't a joke. Uh, Sam Peltzman uh, re reacted to seatbelt legislation by saying, no, they should put spikes on the dashboard. And That's that what I was referring to. It. Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I don't think, so the, the uh, availability, I can't imagine, I know a lot of old people, I'm actually virgin on being one myself, the fact that the ICUs uh, might be available, I don't think is really going to make a lot of difference. Uh, once you get to the ICU, uh, the, IC, the ventilator is the modern version of the chaplain. Uh, you know, I've seen like 80% death rates once you get on a ventilator. You, you don't want to get in the ICU even if it's available. Um, I think Daron is exactly right. I mean, a fact that I hope is going to evolve in our public discussion about this is that it does mainly get old people uh, sick, sick people as well. So a strategy of 
uh, isolating the old people um, would make a lot of sense. There's this problem of who's this we? <laughs> what is our state capacity for making fine bureaucratic decisions of this sort? Uh, but a lot of, uh, this is also something that's happening uh, endogenously. Um, old people are being really careful and old people tend to be retired so they don't have to go out to work. Uh, so to the extent, you know, healthy old people who aren't in nursing homes are gonna be really careful. Uh, what we're gonna do about nursing homes is another good question. Okay, so we did it again. We ran over quite significantly, but I think it's a good sign. Uh, thanks a lot, John. It was fantastic to have you on. And I would like to do some advertising for Friday. Larry Summers will talk about, to some extent, probably secular stagnation. You see the other view and also some geopolitical arguments. Uh, and as I said earlier, we will do some technological innovation there. So there might be a little bit of experimentation going on also on your behalf. So thanks again for joining us and uh, being loyal to us for so long. And I hope to see you on Friday again. And thanks to you, John. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming, everybody. It's been a pleasure.